Hi, this is Ellen McChrystal and you are listening to The New Mind. Today's guest is Danielle Mason. Now, I've just told Danielle that I um, was genuinely a massive fan when she started her career in glamour modeling and on page three. Um, And I've just said to her, and I'm going to say the same thing, she had a bit of a Hollywood vibe at that time, I felt, the sort of Pamela Anderson, Sophia Loren, Marilyn Monroe look. And I was mesmerized by Danielle. So to have her on the chair with me today is a massive, massive privilege for me. (laughs) But she's not here to talk about just that side of her. Um, In fact, there's a whole story uh, from that beginning of her career through to where she is now. And as you know, this is a storytelling podcast because essentially I want to kind of bring people in and connect people to the story so that you can, I guess, work out what's going on in your mind through listening to other people and connecting to the uh, the deeper parts of people's minds and hearts. So here we go. Hello, Danielle. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I genuinely am. I, I said to you a minute ago, I'm genuinely a fan and it's a bit surreal having you here. I think it's surreal you saying that. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was that that we just said, didn't we? That time where you went into glamour modeling and the page three stuff, it was just different then. Oh, it's so different. Like it was, it was most definitely the best years of my life. Yeah. Apart from having my children. Yeah. But I mean, back in the single years, um, doing page three, like traveling the world and doing calendars and yeah. being pinups. Um, yeah, it was just something really exciting I think I found it very exciting it looked exciting as well and mm. we were we were just saying weren't we that so much has changed because the way the industry works now and also yeah the way we are I guess as women not supposed to enjoy that type of thing we're not supposed to want to show our bodies mm. and it's almost like to find your space now in that feminist movement I guess which is sort of risen and risen and risen mm. it's quite confusing because I I openly say that I think women have the right to do what they want with their bodies yeah and if you want to take your clothes off to earn money or if you want to go and be a mechanic or you know a psychotherapist you have the right to choose so yeah it feels like a strange space at the moment and coming from that that space to where you are now you probably feel it more than anybody well yeah I mean um obviously Things have changed a lot with Mm. like, I know when I was younger, like people, how do I get into glamour modeling? How do I get into glamour modeling? So like I used to kind of coach girls. I even did a TV show actually coaching um, a girl. Um, What was that? It was, is it, was it Gypsies Next Door? So I took a traveling girl. I think I remember this. Yeah, it was for Channel 5. Yes, I do remember. Yeah, I coached her, but then she kind of realized it wasn't for her. Right which is fair enough. Um, But when I was younger, I I loved it. It was like the best years of my life. used to go to the best parties, travel the world. The money was good, which is what we were just touching on. Things have changed. Yeah. Um, So now I hear that rather than getting 50K for doing um, a glamour model shoot in a top well-known magazine, the girls are actually paying the magazines to do to to be on the front cover so for me like I could never go from getting paid to do something to paying them yeah no see that for me that just shows that that's not that's about fame I think yes not actually like not the job itself appreciated yeah do you know what I mean because I think you know from what I can see about most women that have been glamour models they also have to become business women yeah and I think if you're paying it's almost like it's it, it, what take, are you doing it for yeah exactly is it I your career it. or is it a moment I suppose with things like TikTok and OnlyFans and all of these things you can make quite a lot of money and then you can accelerate it by paying to go on the magazines that's probably what they're okay, doing yeah no I I get that I get that but it's not the same industry is it? it's totally different yeah, but then it's kind of, I mean, I'm not into the whole um, OnlyFans thing purely because I'd gone off doing um, my housekeeping presenting and things like that. Yeah. So I thought that might hinder me or put me in a funny light. I've got nothing against people that do OnlyFans. No. In fact, sometimes I feel like I just want to jack it all in and get on OnlyFans because yeah. apparently the money's so good. Yeah. 
Is it? Yeah, I, I, I hear it is. <laughs> I mean, I haven't done it. A lot of people have suggested that I did the, the naked psychotherapist on there. And I was like... Oh, that would be good. Yeah, it'd be an interesting thing to do. Yeah. But I, I don't think I'd get paid very much. <laughs> I'm sure you would. I think, I, think I'd, I think I'd lose business. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. Um, but no, what were we saying? We were just saying that the, the, the way that it is now is that you've gone in from, from the glamour modelling and you've actually gone into like doing your cleaning and doing mm. that influence thing with the cleaning and building that brand. But, and you were saying, actually, would it hold me back if I was to then do OnlyFans and go back into that world that I actually started in? Um, the problem I've got is obviously I've just turned 40 this year. My little boy would kill me. Yeah. Yeah. He's at that age. It's 11. I don't think it's fair. Yeah. If you've got kids that age, um, unless there's a way you can keep it private, but you just can't keep anything you couldn't. private. You couldn't. Because you can't. You're, you and are And he known. would get picked on it for that. Yeah. So I wouldn't do it for that reason for a start. Um, but I mean, each that, if you want to earn money that way, that that's, that's great. Yeah. If, if that's what you want to do but I agree sometimes when I think like there's other areas of life that I enjoy and I think when you enjoy something that's when the money will come in yeah like, without you even knowing in it because it is your like you get girls out there obviously that are like oh they want to be famous but they don't know what for but then if you take it like you've got a talent that you enjoy it everything will naturally come anyway yeah yeah, yeah, it does. And it's finding what you enjoy. Yeah. And and that's what that's what you've gone into. But there's there's a background to this, isn't there? Like mm. you so it's um Miss Mason's cleaning. Yeah. And MMC. We're, we're MMC and we're building well, you're building that brand right now, aren't you? You're really yeah. doing a lot with that and you know, you've had a lot of press around it and so on, and your Instagram's really focused on that that new side of you. What led you from being on the front of these magazines? into the the world of cleaning well it was kind of a it wasn't an accident okay right yeah it was kind of but I do enjoy cleaning so what happened was I um from the age of 16 I used to work at travel lodges which is where I ha how I learned to make beds putting your sheets on and things like that because we used to have to do so many yeah. in so little time so when I was 16 I was making money doing that um on the side I then went off and worked on an airline. Did um, you? Yeah, on BMI. Wow. Yeah, and then obviously I started doing page three. Yeah. But I was still into cleaning, like still doing it. And then uh, some of my friends had cleaning companies, so I used to go off with them, like if I wasn't doing anything. Um, and then I carried on doing the reality TV stuff and um, modelling, but still doing cleaning on the side. Um, and then I set up a cleaning company which I did have people working for me but the problem was everybody always wants to call in sick so I would just have my own private clients that yeah. I kept but that worked really well because I could fit it as and when yes and that was like my bit of food shop or whatever for the week yeah um, was this after kids by the way this was a bit before and after I had kids, but it fitted in really nicely with the kids because they were so young and it was, um, I could fit in it around nursery. So yeah. I could, as soon as I dropped them off, I could go off and do a job and then come back and pick them up. It was just easy going like a nine to five. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, I did that. And then obviously I was still doing my TV stuff, still doing the modeling. Um, I had a, a couple of big TV shows at the time, which big fat gypsy wedding yeah I didn't actually get everyone thinks I got married I didn't get married just to set that straight but um obviously I was with a traveler for quite a few years and um that's when the cleaning like really kicked off because that's all I did all day yeah was literally clean um he'd go out and do whatever he was doing and I would literally be at home with the children cooking and cleaning so wow. it was like day in day out um, from getting up in the morning like watching his mum clean like they're literally so pristine yeah the traveling women with like cleaning windows and even like to the wheels on the bed like scrubbing them with toothbrushes like and they just open your eyes even more to like things like taking your shoes off and yeah. don't wash your hands in the sink in the kitchen sink where you're washing your vegetables like just yeah it was just I just learned so much and learned so much about products and stuff like that 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 was it I just carried on doing the like cleaning company and that was going well wow 
then when I went to train with my presenting, um, the guy that I went to see that did my show reel was like, like, do you, do you, is there like a niche? Like, is there anything that you really like? And I'm thinking, I want to get away from cleaning because I'm going to, I'm <laughs> going to be a presenter. And he was like, no, Danielle, you need to embrace the cleaning and be good housekeeping. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, he's got a point. Obviously I've got so much knowledge yeah. on cleaning. Like, so it coincided really well. So I You've just blended the two. Yeah, I've blended the two. So with a bit of knowledge and then presenting and yeah but that's really interesting because I always say to people whether it be one-to-one clients in psychotherapy that are sort of a bit stuck in life and they're looking for a purpose and a Mm. passion I always say don't overcomplicate it if there's something you enjoy it could be anything could be peeling potatoes Mm. if that's what you enjoy make a business out of it it doesn't have to be (laughs) potatoes. I've never had anyone actually say that I don't know why that came into my mind that's right (laughs) but it just makes me think you know sometimes you do something and you you know you're mindlessly doing it like peeling potatoes and your mind just drifts off into almost like a meditative state Mm. because you're just doing the repetitive thing some people love that they love ironing I can't think of anything worse some people love it yeah that I find I find cleaning and ironing and things like that really therapeutic yes like especially when if you suffer with anxiety and things like that that's really helped me and in lockdown Oh, I don't know about you, but the whole good housekeeping thing just coming because you always you, we were always at home. Yeah, yeah. So then with COVID out of the way, obviously, if you see cleaning hacks and things like that, we're going yeah. viral. Yeah, and these are people that don't even have a cleaning background. So it, it was just after COVID, so it worked well because the good housekeeping thing was like a big thing at the time yeah people love watching cleaning hacks yes people love cleaning advice and covid had actually really enhanced yeah the whole cleaning thing so i just ended up not just ended up but i um you yeah it just worked there. really well and then i went off to do you know ideal home show ideal world and it was just like regular presenting which i loved it and then i was talking about something that i actually generally knew about yeah <laughs> So actually, so that timeline's so interesting. Mm. You, you start off cleaning as a sort of like Saturday job, if you like. Yeah. And then you go into the airlines and then you go into page three and glamour modeling. But because I suppose if that work wasn't coming in, you wanted something else to do, you were carrying on doing this private yeah. bit of cleaning. Yeah. And then the two worlds have merged beautifully together. Yeah. And so, and here we are now. But yeah. was there a point... Um, Speaking about lockdown, because I know it affected a lot of people's income. Mm-hmm. Was there a point where you were thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to make my money? And Yeah, I ended up at the food bank. Right. Yeah, me and my kids ended up at the food bank. I think it was, was it just after COVID or just it was before? I don't know if it was right bang in the middle. Um, but, yeah, no, it was really hard. Mm. And I remember it was around Easter time and these old ladies were so sweet. I went down there and I was just like, eh. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what's going on. Like, And they were like, oh, no, come in. They were so sweet. Aww. And they literally gave me about 15 chocolate Easter eggs for the kids because oh, they were wow. like, we've got so much chocolate. It's, so I took it and I really, I really cried. Just because, because just, I was just so grateful. Yeah. So now whenever I see like the food bank when I've been shopping, I always top it up. That is really nice. And was that purely because of lockdown that you got there? Or was that that yeah, com- combination? Th- no, it was a combination. There was just no work coming in over lockdown, especially. Yeah. I know like loads of people were like, there was a bit of influence work, but it was obviously no one was really buying clothes. So like I was getting asked to promote clothes and stuff, but then no one was really buying it yes. because nobody was going out. But they were buying the track suits and stuff and the dress. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was just a very funny time for everyone, wasn't it? It was. And so for you, because a lot of your work would have been going out and yeah. doing things out. I suppose like yeah. anything, if you're in the public eye, you had to find a new way to, to be, to earn money. And th- this is how this really... Did it supersede this cleaning thing? Do you yeah. think if it hadn't been for lockdown, you'd have gone so heavily into it? Or? No, lockdown definitely, definitely influenced over the cleaning because um, 
people didn't really know a lot about cleaning and I think lockdown actually got people really um, educated about the whole cleaning thing because yeah. they was at home all the time. All they had to do was clean yeah. and I was like, well, I was doing this anyway when I was with my ex. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> all there is to know, do not yeah. wash your hands in the kitchen sink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it it just and I think that's when they found Mrs Hinch as well wasn't it was it during was it that in, time sure that's when she blew up and I'm sure she was a hairdresser as well but people just really liked her cleaning hacks it's mad isn't it like how you can be thinking oh this is where I should go yeah in terms of this is my business this is what I know but actually it, it that's the beauty of the internet like they so I've just done um another uh podcast that's not out it'll be out on Thursday actually so whenever you listen to this, it may be out or not, but it, it, he is an artist painter and he said he used the internet or particularly Instagram to show him what was popular. Yeah. So he'd put something out there and if it got a lot of likes, he knew what he, he should focus on. Yeah. And really that's the way it's gone now, isn't it? Is that you mm. think, oh, I'm going to do this, this and this, but something else that you're doing that just happens to accidentally blow up. Accidentally. Yeah. Like I just put out um, some silly cleaning hack about, how I didn't like using glass cleaner on a big glass table. It's like fairy liquid and that blew up and went viral. And I was like, what? Yeah. Just, <laughs> I didn't even think. I was just literally like, I'll do a quick hack. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was like going up and up and up. And I was thinking, what? Yeah. <laughs> just about putting fairy liquid on your glass table, which most people do anyway. But loads of people didn't know about it. And I was like, what? Well, that's the beauty of your TikTok and your Instagram and all these other little ones that are out there. Like I say little, it's not little, it's Facebook, but it's not as popular for those cleaning yeah. hacks as the other two. So it just goes to show that you never know what's around the corner. No. And you it's things that you think won't like do well, usually are the things that do do well. Yeah, they are. Strange. And, and I would say this as well, is that everyone is we're making this about Instagram and TikTok, but everyone's really hyper focused on what can I do to get those likes. Don't just do you. Yeah, no, that is so true. Yeah. Don't focus on trying to get a viral. Like just just do you. Natural. Yeah, do you? Um, I've got to admit, like sometimes I just cannot be bothered with yeah. um social media. It's hard, isn't it? Like I've had a bit of a break from TikTok. I find TikTok. Sorry, I like I do like TikTok, but um. A lot of stuff on there. I don't understand why TikTok has it up because it's yeah. disgusting. Some yeah. stuff and it's strange. So negative. Really, some of it. yeah, you are right. I obviously I focus mostly on Instagram, which is where I get most of my. I like Instagram. I do. It's not as heavy. Yeah, you, you get like ripped on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, and I find that it's a bit. It's a certainly a more toxic environment. Oh my god, yeah. People and are I, always arguing on there, and yeah. I just think. Like, how can you think, like, obviously you want to get viral likes or whatever, but no decent brand's going to want to work with you when you're arguing. No, it's a strange and energy. It is. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, if you fancy watching someone argue, then go on TikTok. But um, it's just not good energy. No, it's not. And we were talking and about you, energy, yeah. weren't we? We, we, yeah, like, we the, like good energy. We like the magical stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not the arguments. Not I mean, you mentioned earlier, actually, that one of the things um, that, that cleaning and, and ironing and all that sort of stuff has helped you with is anxiety. Yeah. So that's obviously something that you've dealt with. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people deal with anxiety and they don't know what it is. I yeah. mean, I remember when I started getting panic attacks, I thought I was dying. I didn't know what the hell, what the hell is this frightened feeling? Yeah. Like, and I went to see a psychiatrist and um, they said to me, oh, so you're in the jungle, you come across a bear and your palms go really, ha like, how do you feel? And I was like, oh, my sweaty palms, tingly face, heartbeat. And he was like, right. He was like, oh, you're having that feeling for nothing. Yeah. Because it does, it just comes out of nowhere. And I was thinking, Jesus. It, you know he's right. He is right. It is to to take that a bit deeper though, what's happened is is that because we're not in the jungle or, you know, we're not a hunter or a gatherer anymore. Yeah. We haven't got the cave and the bear's not outside the cave. But the brain is still functioning in that way primitively. <laughs> yeah, why? why? We've got that me. limbic bit that goes, Well, I'm designed to survive. That that that's what the brain does. It's designed to survive. So it will look for something as the predator 
it's programmed to do that because if we don't look for the predator, the predator will find us. And that's how the brain perceives it unconsciously. So am I just constantly looking for a predator then? Is that why I'm having panic attacks? It could be, but it's not <laughs> it's not that it's not that straightforward. It's probably a sense of um that you know, people talk about the impending sense of doom. Or they're they're so stressed. It could be the kids have played up that day or money worries or, you know, lockdown or relationships or anything, family, all these things that can go on. And we build up this sort of level of cortisol, which is the stress hormone. And we build that up because, oh, that's too much. That's really difficult. I don't know how to cope with that. That's that's out of my control. And over a period of time, that cortisol builds up and the brain then goes, oh, if we're this stressed, there must be a predator somewhere because that's the only reason we should be stressed. Right, okay. That's the unconscious side of it. It's the subconscious kicking in to protect you then. And then there could be just a tiny little thing like a smell or a sound or, you know, just someone brushes past you in the supermarket and shoves you a little bit accidentally. And that's the moment that sets you off. You haven't accounted for at the time all the other things that have been going on in your life is it actually not is it a lack of anything that your brain yeah it can be as well like so if again this is the chicken and the egg right so there's genetic predispositions so you might notice a family history of something that might be learnt behaviors Mm -hmm. or chemical imbalances but then there's things like um cortisol and certainly adrenaline and too much of those negative neuro hormones and the female hormones progesterone estrogen all of that stuff that can impact the whole system because those hormones affect the brain so over time if you've got too much of the bad stuff it it can this is the simplistic way of putting it it can put the good stuff out of whack so all your positive neurotransmitters your your um, serotonin, dopamine, all those endorphins, all those are the wonderful ones that we have. They can be imbalanced if we've got too much of the bad stuff. Okay. So if you've had a lot of stress, you can notice the chemical imbalance starting to happen. And that's when people end up needing a bit more serotonin or or they're not producing dopamine and retaining it for as long as they should mm. or you know, loads of different things. So it's usually a whole holistic bag of shit (laughs) it's not just one thing my brain's just a bag of shit (laughs) you're not a bag of shit but Um, life can create that I do get frustrated though because I just think oh for god's sake Danielle like why can't I just be normal and go on holiday on my own like with the kids where I always need like some comfort blanket there in case I have a panic attack and I just think oh it's so annoying but have you ever gone deep into that no I think if you not that we're going to do this right now on the podcast but if you went through your timeline from birth and I mean birth all the way through to now there'll probably be most people have got 10 key points that were painful stressful or traumatic and then what we have to look at is how that would have affected your system so for example if you at five years old when your brain's still developing, really important developmental time, witnesses a car accident and sees something quite horrific, your brain will adapt to that event. You might actually never physically, I mean, uh, be able to recall it, but your subconscious holds that. Well, the cerebellum does actually, it's part of your brain, like the hard drive. Wow. So you would hold that in the hard drive without thinking about it, but your brain is adapted to that event. So in other words, you might become more hypervigilant. That's so interesting. To yeah. Know. And then there'll be, as you, your brain isn't fully the front part of your brain that does decisions, mm-hmm. analysis, logic, all that kind of wonderful stuff. That doesn't fully develop until uh, 21, 25. So up until that point, those things that are happening to you have an impact on the development of that part of the brain, the front part. Oh my God. So when people say, oh, I'm just so fed up with the fact that I can't seem to control you know, how I feel, I have these panic attacks, that's emotional regulation that happens in the front. And that's the bit that doesn't fully develop until you're 21 to 25. So it's not your fault. And because what we do is we're quite harsh and we judge ourselves quite harshly instead of just thinking, I wonder what it is that I've been through that's hurt me and Mm. that where my brain's had to adapt this way Mm. and showing that little bit of self-compassion and then doing the exploration work and then the reprocessing of how you view yourself. Because most people will do what you've done there, give themselves a hard time and go, well, what's wrong with me? Why can't Mm. I be normal? My question is, first of all, what's bloody normal? 
as a psychotherapist, I can tell you there's no such thing. And secondly, it's just that you haven't learned that, you know, you haven't learned who you are. You, you're looking at yourself now and judging yourself harshly. Mm. But there's I mean, so I, have, I have learned to cope with them. Like yeah. the panic attacks. By using the grounding techniques and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah, and I, like, I don't have them as much as what I used to, but I do take I do take medication yeah. for anxiety. Yeah. Which, which Not a does... lot, just like to top the brain off. Yeah, to give you that little boost. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that either. And I think there's sometimes people hold shame over that and they go, oh, I have to take medication. But no, you do what you've yeah. got to do. Yeah. You know, especially when you've got kids and you ha- just have to be strong for the kids because you have to get them out to school, yeah. feed them. Like, you're literally keeping two more people alive. So, it's a big you responsibility. You have to be like happy and in a good place to do that, most yeah. definitely. And, and what do you think, you know, thinking about that timeline, what do you think are the key moments that might have contributed to not only sometimes the anxiety, but to your, your drive to be successful as well? Um, I think it's more people saying you can't mm. and you know I had like a really toxic relationship and he put me down so much that I was just like big F you yeah like it just makes me want like when people are bitchy or they do nasty things to me or um, don't get me wrong like I used to react like I really used to react and I probably used to be um, you know probably just as toxic because fiery yeah because I don't know I think certain people can bring that out in you yeah it never would now because I wouldn't entertain it if it was toxic now yes but when I was younger I used to entertain toxic and then I fight toxic with toxic so you were reacting to the toxicity yeah and engaging with it yeah and then I used to take that toxic out on other people Mm. um but now I've just got a complete different, I just won't even entertain toxic. So what I was trying to, I can't remember what I, the point I was getting to. Is it was the, the, the series of events that got you to that sort of anxiety? Yeah, and... um, it was just uh, basically because I was on my own with the kids. I had my mum and dad, but it's embarrassing like to say when your mum and dad have put you through private school mm. and then you're going to them saying, oh, I'm skin or like, or I can't. Um, get this it's embarrassing do you still feel that now yeah like because I want to be successful you want to make people proud and I want to make my kids proud as well um because I feel guilty that when they were babies I should have been enjoying that time like I should have been happy um a good mum because that's what not that I wasn't a good mum but I was very unhappy in the first like four years of my kids lives and that must have like affected them in some sort of way and I feel really guilty for that well actually it's really important that you mention that I've just done a recorded again it's not out just yet as we record this it's not out anyway um with Emily Worley who is just the most amazing woman but she's had postnatal depression uh, she had postnatal depression with psychosis, but she also now works with new mums with their babies, sleep, feeding, but understanding and train. She's coming on, joining me on the neuroelectrics method that I'm training next year. She is going to talk about how to prevent nervous system trauma in babies and how to look after yourself as a mother that's struggling with depression and stuff. Yeah. But she's just phenomenal. And this whole guilt thing is because other mums aren't saying, oh, by the way, I struggle too. Everyone's pretending because they're all feeling shameful. They're all feeling like they're doing something wrong. They're all feeling like everybody else is doing it better. They don't feel like they can say to people, I'm really struggling because they're worried about what other people will think. I had a really tough time I really struggled I had OCD and all sorts when I had mine Mm. I really very rarely left the house for about a year and I didn't tell anybody I was so embarrassed like you were just saying there but at the time mine 16 in October and at the time nobody everyone was telling me how wonderful it is to be a mum and I was thinking I loved mine with all of my heart it was the most I've never felt a love like it but I was struggling and nobody was talking about it everyone was telling me that oh, she's like this because you're anxious. She's like this because of you. And it was just like, oh, it's all me. It's, and mm. you just feel the weight of the world on your shoulders. And there is that gloom and it's hard being a mum. Mm. Not for everyone. No, it is hard. But like for people, they were generally suffering. Yeah. Um, like that, that can't be helped, what you're talking about. But I feel guilty because I stayed in this toxic relationship. But why do you feel guilty? Around my children and it's... 
um, because I should have like nipped it in the bud. You can say that retrospectively at the time, because this, a lot of people will listen to this bit and they'll go, yeah, I feel like that too. And I suppose I'm coming from the, the bit of compassion that you may not be showing for yourself. I'm coming from that, uh, compassionate curiosity bit here. When you were in it, you would have made the decision to stay for a reason. And what, what was that reason at the time? The, I thought about this the other day and it was because I craved like the whole family unit. Yeah. I thought it was good for the children, but it's actually not. It's yeah. actually better for a mum to be happy away from that sort of environment. But you had so, to learn that by doing it. Yeah, I get that. So, yeah. But at the I time do. you were just trying to keep everyone together. Yeah, yeah, kind of. But were you just, scared as well? to leave because it's a big thing leaving it's not sometimes easy. I couldn't it wasn't it wasn't straightforward um you know it had took me getting made to have non-molestation orders right. and things like that which at the time I was looking at him like oh my god you're just ruining my family but really like it it paid off in the long run because I'm happy I'm not toxic yeah the kids are happy but I just I my point was I just I felt like when they were babies that they could I would have liked them to be in a more happy environment not such a hostile environment but like you say I mean it was abusive it wasn't just toxic yeah it yeah and I, I think sometimes two people can bring that out worse yeah and I think because I was young as well I didn't, um, rather than walking away and not argue, I'd argue back. Yeah. And just do the most craziest stuff. And I look back and I think, what the hell was I doing? Yeah. What was I doing? But you, you don't, again, I see this with a lot of women that have been in those types of relationships. Would you say that you felt, I don't want to put words into your mouth. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Just make sure you stop me. But did you feel that you could just walk away or did you feel almost conditioned to stay like did you feel like you didn't have much of a choice um if um, when I did try and get away um it would I would kind of get sucked back in again like yeah. I'd just start getting good and then I would get kind of sucked back in like with the love, love bombing, bombing yeah. yeah and things like that so you know I just yeah, it was just, I don't know, when you're young and you don't understand that sort of relationship, you know, you just go along with it. And I lost a lot of friends. Mm. Like, I lost so many friends. But now I look back and think, you weren't really my friend anyway. Correct. Because I do have friends that do did stay by yeah. me. Yeah, Um, But I think unless you've been in that type of relationship, you don't understand. It's like a bit of an addict. Yeah. Because... It, what is it the trauma bond trauma bond yeah yeah like I swear like I would have this trauma like uh, it's only since I've learned about it because I didn't understand it no I'd think he really loves me though but I can't understand why he's acting like that and it would go on and on and on and on and then I would see like a nice bit and I'd crave that nice bit back so much and I and the harder I'd work like to try and get that bit of attention back like the first you know how they are at the beginning it was just getting worse. Mm. <laughs> Do you see the on that trauma bond? It's really important to explain the process of that in the brain because we talk about it as an addiction, and it actually is. Mm. Because what happens is, if you're love bombed, yeah, this is the grooming, right? Some people call it love bombing. I always say, actually, think of it as grooming. They're grooming you, mm. and they're conditioning you to believe in this version of them. Once you're in and you've believed it and your brain's gone, wow, this person's amazing, they'll start to gradually, slowly at first, chip away, confuse you, you know, the gaslighting thing. Mm. And and then what they'll do is they'll discard you for a bit and then love bomb you back in. Yeah. And they'll keep doing that and keep doing that. And then those periods of discard go on for a lot, lot longer. And then when they give you that love bombing again, dopamine, oxytocin all those wonderful neurotransmitters all those chemicals it's mad, isn't it yeah like like when you have like a, you know a, a nice glass of something bubbly and you get that lovely warm feeling you get that with the love bombing mm. and then they make you wait longer and longer so you, you get hooked into oh I know I'm yeah. going to get it at some point I don't know when but it's going to be okay again I've just got to try harder and again that's the thing that sticks in your head 
I've got to try harder because I know he can love me. I know how lovely he can be. Mm. I just got to get back there because I've done something wrong. It's my fault. And then the reactive thing happens. So you see this with a lot of narcissistic relationships and a lot of kind of abusive relationships where the woman will end up screaming and shouting at the man after he's really um, poked the bear. And he's yeah. done it. He's done it subtly. Oh at yeah. First. Then you're the nutty one. Then you're the nutty one. It's yeah. the same thing every time. Yeah. Uh, but that's called a reactive. I abuse. see it a mile off now, though. Yeah. But back then, I, I didn't. I didn't get it. No. I didn't get it, and everyone would be like, "That girl was nuts," and I'd be like, "You don't." I'm, nobody would see. Like it the was the poking of yeah. the bear. It yeah. was the poking of the bear. And of course, back then, you've got to remember, people talk about narcissistic abuse all the time now mm. you only have to go on to instagram for two minutes and there'll be someone talking about love bombing gaslighting or whatever, mm. whatever so the education is there i'm not saying it's always the best way to get educated but at least you've got these sound bites you wouldn't have had that yeah. everything you know now is post relationship and for the girls that are in those types of relationships now if if they're on instagram it's easy for them to get that information or on tiktok again i'm not always saying that's completely accurate but at least it gives them a an idea of what's going on. I used to sit there and I used to Google it. Why does he love me one minute and hate me the next? And then that's when all this narcissist stuff yeah. comes. And then I would be cleaning and I would put on a YouTube video about narcissist yeah. abuse to try and get my head round because I could not get my head round it. Like, yeah. I just couldn't. I yeah. didn't. I, I, I was generally like, what the hell is going on here? Like I was really hooked. Like, my mum and dad were even at the point like you can't go on like we <laughs> like my friends were cutting me off because I felt like an absolute nutter. Yeah. And I couldn't work out like obviously since then I've been in other relationships. There's not even shouting. Yeah. And I'm like, but then this relationship, I didn't get it. And I had like I had my kids and it was You were vulnerable. Yeah, I just I don't I was weak and it it you weren't weak you you felt weak you yeah. were you were conditioned and groomed you were vulnerable there's a difference but then how are they that clever to do that because I wouldn't do they even know that they're actually doing it yeah they like, definitely do <laughs> they do uh, uh, some people have traits it must just come naturally though to them oh yeah so, it's programmed it's probably yeah, learned yeah it'd be learnt behavior so they'll think that's normal yeah yeah but they know what they're doing they know it, it, there's a book um I'm, I'm, hopefully i get this right it's called the games people play mm. and it's one of the recommended reading books i had 20 years ago when i started training mm. um and and it talks about the games people play it, 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 there's a lot in there about like the manipulation and all those sorts of things you can use positive manipulation so think about sales if you're a salesman you can go to someone, look, this hoover is the best hoover for you because you've got a bad back, right? So mm. this is lightweight, but the suction on it's really, really good. I'm referencing hoovers because like you're your cleaning. I do well. <laughs> so that's that's positive manipulation because actually it's going to benefit you. Mm. What what narcissists do, they know they're selling you something so that they can manipulate you for their own gain, not for yours, for theirs. You know, you buying that hoover that's lightweight is beneficial for you because you want a hoover you definitely already know that but you've got a bad back so you need something lightweight this benefits you mm. obviously they're making something out of it as well with the narcissist the only benefit goes to the narcissist there's no benefit for anybody else and they see they do see vulnerability now that vulnerability might be that you're a really nice person you're an empath and you might like really want to help people and fix people and please people they might go for that because you're likely to they buy do, into though, it don't they yeah. God, because now, like, when I meet people, like, if I meet a guy now and they're, like, really nice, I get paranoid. <laughs> yeah. Is this love bombing? Is yeah. this genuine? Like, yeah. Well, you will do because that, that trauma, that emotional trauma that you go through in those types of relationships, it leaves you hypervigilant and sometimes too hypervigilant. It takes a while to come out of that. Yeah. And I'm guessing your anxiety and panic attacks were actually complex PTSD after an abusive relationship. Yeah, but I never did any work on that though. No. I never did any work. But um yeah, I think I just didn't want to cover it again. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, I'm so done with that. I don't even want to go back and revisit it. And you're right, because a lot of therapists, uh, I don't actually do this unless the person wants it. They do just want you to talk. Whereas I will use things that are somatic healing like hypnotherapy and uh 
EMDR, Google it. I've, I've referenced it in other mm. episodes, but I'm not saying you Google it. I'm saying to the listeners, eye movement desensitization, reprocessing. It might be worth tagging a resource onto this episode actually for people, yeah. which I will make sure happens um, because they are therapies where you don't have to talk. You get to reprocess yeah. the brain. I mean, there's a bit of talking, obviously, but it's not like, so yesterday I went home and he did this, and, you know, or, or I left him six years ago and I'm not over it and I just want to talk about it. That obviously helps to some degree, but it's the other therapies that really help you to reprocess how you view yourself. Because mm. there's, I think there's a little bit of you probably still stuck in some level of, yeah, but I was a bit, so it's my fault. I'm not saying you think that, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. No, because I wasn't innocent. Like I would argue back. But you, no one's innocent. I remember, like one time. Oh my god! So I was like eight months pregnant, and we were having an argument. And this is I climbed out of a window eight months pregnant, and was running down a main road with no shoes on, and wow. just a uh, uh, top. I think I went into labour the next day, like down a main road like people driving past thinking what is she doing just chasing him because I, I don't know why yeah I'm just so I'm just sick of having anxiety and panic yeah. attacks yeah it was just mental and I look back and I think well, what were you doing well you were in the trauma zone you were oh. in the trauma reactive zone which you know is very complex and very difficult to understand until you do that sort of deeper work with it but it's essentially one of those things that I think people need to understand happens when you're in an abusive relationship it's not you it's that abusive relationship yeah it's like I've got a friend of mine now and she rings me and she is going through the same thing and I just think oh my god I know exactly like yeah. how I used to feel like that ang she's constantly got anxiety and like I say to her like you just need to leave him babe like it's not going to get any better but she still stays yeah and it it's um it's not nice to watch it's difficult it's difficult when you especially but if you've been there. I understand so yeah. that's why I listen but I think Jesus was I this draining about my relationship well it's not draining but you know you get to that point yeah there would be times like I'd be on the floor like literally pleading like begging begging yeah crying like wanting to chuck myself off a bridge like how can you get that like get that into that and it yeah it just and it angers me because I think I should have been happy like playing with my children mm -hmm. like putting positive energy into the kids but instead I'm having all these stupid arguments that I don't even want to be having and I don't understand why I'm having them mm -hmm. and it was getting to the point my mum was like you are losing your marbles you need to get out of this relationship because you are it, you're not mentally stable <laughs> And it does do that. It does do that to people. And I think the thing is that I hear a lot from women that have been in those, uh, well, certainly narcissistic abusive relationships, because although there's a lot of information about that all over the place now, you know, 20 odd years ago when people were getting into those relationships, and I work with women that are still in those relationships, mm. they've been seeing me for ages and nobody else knows apart from me. The, the problem is, is that we didn't consider coercive control and financial abuse and gaslighting and love bombing and we didn't consider all of these things to be abusive behaviors abuse used to be labeled as sexual or physical that was it yeah nothing else mattered as you know have you been hit has he you know has he raped you or has he mm. sexually assaulted you because if he hasn't he can do what he wants mm. but we now understand the impact of trauma on the brain when it's emotional trauma when it's control and it does break people down and it does leave them in quite a trauma mindset which takes a while to to recover from because the, the the abuser wants you to blame yourself the abuser wants everybody else to think you're the mad one the abuser wants everybody oh, else I couldn't do that to someone though no of course you can because no, you're I a nice person yeah but I don't understand how people have that mentality to be that nasty it's usually generational trauma that that's been handed down and like I said they learned that behavior through those through those behaviors that have been modeled to them Okay. Um, so I'm not trying to, people often think, because I'm quite compassionate, having come from an abusive family, I'm quite compassionate to the abuser, not because um, I'm sort of feeling sorry for them, but mm. if I can understand them, yeah, then I can let go of it as something that's wrong with me. Mm. And then I can look at what I'm doing wrong. Because you said earlier, I wasn't innocent. Let me tell you now, I'm flawed. Um, I am not perfect. I am not 
a hundred percent good a hundred percent of the time so we also should look at ourselves with you know that self-reflective compassion Mm. try not to judge yourself because when you judge yourself you go into quite a negative mindset and it's kind of like letting the abuser live rent free in your head it's it's more important to look at yourself from an objective point of view and say actually I can see that I'm struggling here because maybe when I was 16, I had a boyfriend, he made me feel bad. I didn't feel Mm. good about myself. And I kind of carried that through to my future relationships. I'm simplifying it. But you can see that when you're of a delicate age, if you believe something to be true, and you never tell anyone or you never have the right people to talk it through with, you can carry those belief systems into future relationships, which leaves you vulnerable. So education is key for young people, especially young girls, Mm. especially these days, like it's so easy to manipulate, especially with the internet and the amount of different fake profiles people can set up. Like you can have 10 lives if you want to now. Mm. So we do need to educate. And I think it's it's always about understanding generational trauma, how that impacts behavior. That's not your fault. That's his problem, which he needs to sort out. You don't need to do that for him, but as part of your recovery from that traumatic experience or relationship, it's learning self-compassion don't let the abuser live rent free in your head and make you feel like it's your fault because it's not. Yeah. Reaction to being abused and and reaction doesn't always look pretty. I've been there, done that, worn that it t-shirt. Doesn't. It doesn't. And that's when you go, oh, I am mad. Mm. And I, I, I've felt, I, I was a ve- I've spoken openly about this, my mum and dad staying together after what my dad did and then me being made to feel like I was the problem I have screamed in a way that is, it looks like I'm a psychopath. I can't, I can't, yeah, because you, it's frustration. It's frustration and frustration turns into anger and anger turns yeah. into rage. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're presenting that way. I would be, way, I, I think, I think that's perfectly normal to it feel is the normal. way you feel. Yeah, in the situation I where you're being abused. I frustrated as well, yeah. yeah. But there's no way that I could stay with a man that had done that to my daughter no it's a strange thing for people to get their heads around but then you, it might be the way that she's been brought yeah, up you yeah. know brush there's things under the carpet kind exactly of thing. that the ostrich thing where yeah. you put your head in the sand and hope for the best yeah that's what it is and that's that i don't want to say it's that generation but certainly for me to to look at the links in my mum's life and in my dad's life just enabled me to go oh, okay well that's their lives that's their yeah. issues and I'm going to fix me now. Yeah. It's not. But that's right. That's yeah. how I've learned. Like yeah. you, you have to kind of look out for number one and yes. then everyone else is happy. That's so if true. If I'm not happy, my kids aren't going to be happy. So. Correct. <laughs> it's just, you have, yeah, sometimes you just have to put yourself first. Self-prioritization is the way forward. Mm. It's being, a that teaches your kids to do the same for themselves as well. That's the cycle being broken then. Mm-hmm. It's so important. And look, you know, you are a a formidable character. You've done so much with your life already. And then this next phase of your life, I think we go into businesswoman mode. We are. We've had a chat. We've had a chat and it's a very (laughs) exciting chat. But this is the, this is the, if you think about the, the butterfly, and I've used this analogy a lot, you will go from caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly several times in your life. Mm. And I think when we're younger, we think, right, we do get our GCSEs, get our A-level, go to uni, get a job. That's me sorted. Have our kids. It's not like that. You've got to go through that metamorphosis so many times Mm -hmm. and you've got to forgive yourself for the mistakes you make along the way. And and this is where we're going with, with this conversation with you. You know, you went through all those different cycles you ended up at the food bank and then you've really just gone, actually, the cleaning thing works, the presenting thing works, and here we are today. Yeah. So what's the kind of like hopes for yourself and, you know, your family for the future? Um, career-wise, mm. so um, I'm looking, obviously, at the moment, bringing my own cleaning products out. Yes. Looking at writing a book. Yes. Um, I've had a few meetings with some TVs, uh, TVs, <laughs> with um, some TV shows, which are in the pipeline. Um, I just did a Channel Five show actually with one of my friends. Um, I don't think I can't say the name yet, but um, it was to do with cleaning. So I literally went in and sorted their rotor out and taught her other half how to do some cleaning bit wow I mean that sounds phenomenal yeah so I think that's out later this year or next year 
Um, what else have I got? <laughs> well, you're going to, I think what we, what we're, we were talking about earlier is the things that you're hoping to do with sort of building that brand and, you know, doing your TV stuff and all the presenting stuff still, but having the brand really take off in the background is the, is the goal, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, that is the goal. Because we that were discussing uh, and I kind of thought it was a good point actually to bring into the conversation about whatever you do you know whether it's starting off as a model or starting off as a psychotherapist it doesn't really matter I think as women we need to understand the business world more now I actually totally agree yeah I really agree yeah like that's Matt, I've had a chat with you before yeah and I was just like god I don't actually know this side of the fence <laughs> yeah but if you've got all of the stuff that you've got you've got your contacts through the, the you know the work that you've done 20 odd years ago you've got all this experience in what you do all this knowledge mm. and you said something like you've got all the ingredients you put it in the oven but it's just not coming out yet sometimes yeah sometimes, sometimes I feel like that. but it's not actually the case you're actually probably doing far better than you give yourself credit for because yeah. you know like most <laughs> successful people imposter syndrome kicks in and you just feel like a failure even when you're not what's imposter syndrome that's when you're doing actually really quite well but you still think you're rubbish okay that's the simplified version okay. of it okay yeah i get that i think we are generally really hard on ourselves though, we aren't are we? we are yeah and i think the only thing that I, I mean, school doesn't really teach business training no it doesn't and I'm, actually i'm butting heads with my son's school yes at the moment, i bet you are okay. yeah i've yeah. spent a lot of time doing that with my daughter's school it's not been fun because I just fundamentally think that the education system is not providing what it should. It doesn't have the money. No, it doesn't. It, um, especially with like, I've just had one of my kids diagnosed autistic and there's just no help. Like yeah. there's, but they're not going to say there's no funding in there, but there isn't the no, money there, isn't. there. Like we've got a key worker and stuff. And she does say to me, she's like, that since COVID, the education system's just not recovered because no. kids are obviously like, there's a lot of kids coming out ADHD, autistic yeah. at the moment, but that's because I feel that the world is moving forward. So are people, they're like, what's the word? Evolving. Evolving. Yeah. People are evolving yeah. and the education system isn't. No, it's not. So you're getting these reactive kids. Yeah. Because they're still back in the old days with the education yeah. system. Well, it's, it's, it's nuts. I'm going to reference the same book again. I've said, I, I reckon there's, if this book doesn't increase in sales, because I've mentioned it in every episode, mm. Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill references the education system in 1928. And in 1928, he says the education system is outdated. It's still the same education system today. Yeah, but that's what that's where all these kids are like misbehaving because they're evolving yeah. and the education system isn't. Yeah. So it's just um, a big clash at the moment. So, I mean, with my son, we're on like suspension 17 since year seven. Yeah. Um, bearing in mind, he is autistic. Yeah. And he's in mainstream school. Yeah. They don't have the funding there. So I think they just send him home because they can't. And I know there's so many mothers in my situation. Oh, there is. Like, so I feel so passionate about So that do I. Because I'm so angry about someone. it. Yeah. But it's the, it's the government. It They're, is, yeah. They need to put more money into yeah. the schools. If you look at the services at the minute, NHS, mm. education, they, they're the two most Terrible. important ones. Absolutely broken. And, and the policing, you know, it's not there. Yeah. But yet they're putting so much funding into, like, wars. Yeah. Which makes <laughs> you like, question the whole yeah. system. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that's where we could get into a whole... But uh, I am angry because... I work with a lot of young people in my psychotherapy clinic and the amount of kids that are put into exclusion, they sit in a room oh, yeah, all day that's on Rudy. That's my son. It's He's absolutely in exclusion. horrific. Yeah, it's literally mental abuse. It is. Uh, not, I don't mean it like that, mental abuse, but it is um, mentally mind-numbing for them because yeah. when he is suspended and I have to go out to work, what my son sits in his room with a packed lunch all day. Yeah, like, it's how awful. How is that? And he's autistic. Yeah. It's awful. Oh, it, that's not. It's it is okay. It's not necessarily intentional abuse. The system yeah. abuses him. Yeah. So I I agree with that. It, if you isolate a child and make them feel that there's something wrong with them, which they are which, doing, can you imagine yeah. the self esteem issues, well, the self worth no, issues? He's got no confidence. Yeah. He's got no it, confidence. Horrific. He can't even look at them. Like when people talk to him and stuff. Like I do feel really sorry for him because. The only thing that gives him confidence is his football. Yeah. 
and they just don't seem to want to promote that no no and and you know again I've said this story before but uh, Jim Carrey has got ADHD mm. and his teacher recognized he had his unique skill set but because he was uh, a bit of a fidgeter a bit disruptive in the class yeah. the teacher said if you sit over there and be quiet at the end of the class you can do your performances to the rest of the kids mm -hmm. so of course he wouldn't disrupt the rest of the class because he was busy creating his performance yeah. look at him now it didn't do mm. him any harm to be treated like an individual yeah and that's what the system isn't set up for mm. but also as I mentioned, Emily Worley early, the, the girl that was talking about birthing and nervous system trauma, there's, she mentioned, and I'm so excited to bring her on board with the project that I'm doing because she mentioned the link between tongue tie, tongue function and oral function, the digestive system and ADHD, the way the brain develops around those difficulties. And we're seeing more and more research going into those early days feeding sleeping and adhd and and you're do you not do you think kids are born with it or are they born with autism and adhd autism is an adhd you can be both by the way you can be on that spectrum yeah. and have both mm -hmm. um but a lot of autism comes from sorry a lot of adhd mm -hmm. sorry about that a lot of adhd comes from various different types of stress and trauma now when I talk about nervous system trauma I'm not talking about emotional abuse physical abuse control we're just talking about the way the body adapts to mm. this the environment and what Emily and I spoke about in our episode was if and we are still c told to do this by the way if you are leaving your child to cry itself out you mm. know self-soothe before the brain has the function to self-soothe which it doesn't until you're 21 to 25 mm. um it, you can do some self-soothing, but even teenagers, they are reactive and they do struggle with emotional regulation because they're not fully developed. If you leave a baby to do that, that's abandonment. And so if you abandon a child, that creates nervous system trauma. The brain and the body link through the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the most important cranial nerve in the nervous system. Why do they not teach you that? Exactly. That's what Emily and I were talking about, which is why she's coming on with my trauma-informed method to go deeper into those birth. Wow. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. Yeah. So you could have abandonment trauma, which creates dysregulation in the brain and the nervous system, which means your brain adapts differently. Mm. If you are, uh, you know, this attached parenting style, which everyone's like, oh, it's full of hippies. No one should do that. Actually, it, there's a lot of evidence now that says that's much better for the baby and their brain development as wow, well as their nervous okay. system. So with autism though, that I think, because uh, we know there's no gene for ADHD. There might be. Yeah, because he he has that. I mean, both my kids are actually on the CAMS waiting list, which is huge. Yeah. Um, For both. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, I've got one diagnosis, which was autism. But they, I would say they're definitely like mid-range. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I wonder whether there's, you know, genetic predispositions in your family. Because often autism does run through families. ADHD can do because, again, it's generational traumas, brain development issues as a result of those traumas. But it's an interesting area. I've got a psychologist here that, that does that for over 17s. And it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, but the waiting list now for... Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. The, the system is broken. And you're dealing with that on top of all of the the other stuff that we've spoken about today, you know, as a mother. Yeah. Just just dealing with the, the system that doesn't work for your kids. Yeah. And and trying to, you know, do You don't the, understand I know. The, the, the amount of paperwork and pit yeah. courses. And it's a full time bloody job. It is. And when you when you're trying to like you're a single mum, I don't get any help um from um yeah, it's just basically me. Yeah. Obviously, I've got my mum and dad, but I don't go to my mum and dad. Yeah. Um, they're, they're getting on now. Do you know what I mean? So um, I... Um, You're on your own? Yeah. So when the school's constantly calling me, like, be it like half nine, ten o'clock, he's only been in there an hour, they want to get rid of him. It's just so draining. I can't tell... I haven't slept. I've had anxiety. Yeah. I can't eat. <laughs> um, because I'm so stressed over this school because my daughter's about to come up to senior school. Um, I've got EHCP plans going through for both of them at the moment. And um, I just feel like I just want them to be in a good routine. Yeah. But autistic kids need routine. They do. There's no routine in place. No wonder he, it must. Uh, my point is my child's playing up because you don't have the resources. Yeah, the resources. But 
there's no um every day is different like he's in uh isolation yes yeah. he's played up the day before yeah. it's it's sporadic is it that the word sporadic yeah, sporadic yeah um it's not routine no. you've got to have routine when you're autistic and, and i i, I just... couldn't agree more and and the issue that that i've had with with my daughter's school is 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 she's had various different issues going on as well and I I actually don't blame the teachers because they have so little control. If it's run by an academy, they have to go the way the academy goes. But I think what happens is, and I've really seen this, is that the the teachers and the the teaching staff and the educational staff are so defensive because I think everyone's going for them. Because actually, and I've done that myself, actually. I've got really frustrated with them. But I understand the bigger picture, which is, this is systematic. Mm. This is systemic. Sorry, it's not systematic. It's systemic. It's, it's it's the government systems that are broken, which don't allow the education system to change. But when you're meeting with defensiveness with the teaching staff and the schools, put your back up more. Yeah. So yeah. we've just got this real kind of aggressive. I feel anyway like this aggressive energy, and they're dealing with a lot of aggressive parents. I'm trying not to be aggressive with it, but I'm starting to get frustrated and actually yeah. I'm becoming aggressive and I don't want to be that. And, you know, it's really hard. It's really hard. Really, really but hard. Again, the government need to, this is why they're going on the strikes though all the time, yes. isn't it? Because yeah. they're, they're not paid enough to they're deal not. with children. That are like, I mean, don't get me wrong, like children shouldn't swear, but when they've got autism and ADHD yeah. and yeah. they're triggered and they're frustrated, yeah. it just spews out. So it's like automatically, right, suspension, you've sworn. And it's like... A, it's so broken. <laughs> it's so broken, that system. Because those kids are actually going to grow up feeling like they have the world against them. Yeah. Which creates My, my more son problems. only does maths. Yeah, he goes into one lesson, which is maths, and he's just like, um, "I want to do football." Well, Rudy, you know that if you do football, you know you get injuries and things like that. I said, "What? Why are you putting negative on him for?" Yeah, that's what he loves. He likes doing it. Like, let him get on and do it. Like, obviously, I want him in education as well, but they're just so against kids with their dreams as well. They are. You're right. They are really badly. The education system will suffocate your dreams. That is a fact. Yeah, well, maybe it's better him be- being off school then. I don't know. Well, do you know what? I like the social side of it. I think it, oh, kids need to be at school they for do. the social side and yeah. the social skills. But um, all this, like, making them do... I mean, my son sees it black and white. Why? I don't want to be a scientist. Why have I got to go into yes. science for? Yeah. And it's like, because you just do. Yeah. Because we just all had to at school. Yeah. <laughs> we have to do things in life we don't like. And my son's like, well, if I, I, I don't. And it's just like... Oh, no, he's right. So. You know, the way they teach it as well, because I... I um, I'm a sort of like wannabe brain scientist, really. I love it all. And nervous system and body and anatomy and all of that and how it all links. At school, the way it was taught was so dull that I didn't know that I was going to go to that space, you know, space, space, space in the end. I didn't know that's where I'd be yeah. passionate because they didn't teach it in a way that resonated with me. Yeah. So the subjects themselves can be interesting, but if it's taught in a way that's not resonating. Oh, my God, 100%. Yeah, that's the issue is that yeah. they're not reaching the minds. No. They're just following the curriculum. Yeah. But as a parent and as a mum that I think, you know, if I was to just think back 20 years to those, you know, the first time that I saw you or whatever, like, wow, you know, she's so lucky. She's got this amazing life. And actually there's been lots of different parts to your journey since that have been really mm. super challenging. Yeah. But I think the reason I referenced that the, the women really – can benefit from being business women and understanding business and going down that road is because you know your son may not be getting on very well at this school but if you are able to find your passion find find what you're good at and then monetize that you can then have those goals of like I want to earn this much per month so I can put him into private school or so that I can do digital schooling which is another way to educate now which is quite interesting um where they have their schools online, but they also get to meet up with their, like their friends that are in the digital classes mm-hmm. and go on really super duper trips and all that sort of stuff. There's so many different ways that kids can learn now. That yeah, but no. it's funding it. So I've got a tickly throat. <coughs> 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 yeah, a lot of it is funding it because 
<laughs> his school's given him like alternative pr- provision, right? Uh, like twice a week, and then he does like three half days, which he doesn't even get past an hour because he gets sent at home. Yes. But then recently, um, one of them, the football side of it, has been took away from him, and I think it's to do with funding again. Oh no! So it's like the one thing that gives him confidence. Mm. It's now been took away from him. So he's just like got no social skills and he's not getting any from school because he's stuck in um, exclusion exclusion all day. So it's just like mental abuse. Yeah, it <laughs> no, is. <laughs> no, like mental abuse. I mean, I try not to argue with the teachers like I really do. Um, but then it gets to the point where I'm just like, I can't keep watching my child go through this anymore. Yeah, I get it. It's really painful. And if you're stressed, it has a knock-on effect. It's the cycle of stress yeah. in the house. It's really, it's damaging. And again, I think that we were saying all the ingredients you've got for for being a, a top-tier businesswoman, it's, I think the focus for you over the next couple of years is really going to be about building that brand, doing the marketing strategies, you know, getting the money in so that you can actually give your children everything they've ever wanted yeah no, but but I think the one thing that we've got to be careful of as parents and I'm very mindful of this having one that's an only child is that if you give them too much and make it too easy they don't actually have to build resilience and yeah. they don't, but actually you can still provide that even if they've yeah. got a better you know a better education system that works for them yeah and I think that's one of the things what I've always learned is it's not the material things that we have in life that makes us happy is the experiences. If you can give your kids the experience of learning, which they enjoy, then that's everything, isn't it? Mm. But at the minute that's just not happening. No. So it's just, yeah, it's just the education system. Yeah. It's my good. It is. And what's interesting talking to you today is like, you know, if you went onto Danielle's Instagram Mm. or any of her social media, you wouldn't know this about you. You wouldn't know any of these like finer details and it's nice to be vulnerable and authentic and share because so much of what you've said in this episode today is going to be so relatable for so many people Mm. that are going through similar struggles. I think everyone goes through something. Yeah, they do. Everyone's going through something. Yes. Um, And, um, you know, I think people just got to be more aware. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I think what you're giving people today is a conversation starter. Mm. Did you listen to that podcast with Daniel? I'm going through that as well. You know, that's the sort of thing. This is what this is all about, really, is that connection through the story and just going, do you know what? She said a lot there that that I really, really resonate with. And Mm. it's made me want to do my cleaning or it's made me want to get out of my relationship and tell somebody about what's going on for me and that's why I'm really glad that you came because there's so much there about you that I think I don't know whether if people dig for it they can find it but Mm. to have it all in one space where you're sharing so much about your experiences is really powerful yeah oh that's good what's the one thing you would say to anybody be it that they're struggling with you know being a single mum be it that they've been in a difficult relationship or they're struggling financially Mm -hmm. what's the sort of key points for you that's enabled you to push through when you felt like this I mean you mentioned the the chocolate eggs earlier which was obviously a a fundamental point (laughs) um I think the main thing in life is you need to be happy in yourself before you can take care of anyone so if you're a mum you have to be happy in order to bring them children up yeah it's like anything in life if you're if you're not happy you're not going to be going in the right direction you're not going to be having the right relationships you're not going to be having um positive things come into your life so the key thing that I've learned that's helped me is when I'm happy everything around me goes well my kids are happy and I can take care of them with no stress yes and that's what kids need and people around you need just positive energy and what's the thing that makes you happiest other than your kids what what makes you feel really good uh (laughs) can i say um, (laughs) apart from that (laughs) um yeah oh my i'm feeling really good um do you know when my kids achieve something yeah oh apart from the children nothing to do with the children 
um, <laughs> when I achieve something. <laughs> uh, hmm. Is it is it about achieving? Actually, do you feel really happy when you know you've accomplished something? Yeah. 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 You know, like when I get asked if I want to go up for a reality show, I am very yes to those ones that are like where you're not just sat there bitching all day in yeah. a house or something like that. Like the ones where you're actually doing something. Yes. So like it feels like you're getting something back. Like yeah. I've done this achievement. People be proud of me. I love it when um, my kids are proud of me. Yeah. Like they said, they go, well done, mummy. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And obviously, I love it when they do well and they're enjoying having great relationships with their friends and things like that. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> with my kids, <laughs> I never seem to see the upsides of um, the academic side going well, but that doesn't bother me. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, school to me does not teach you how to make money school no. teaches me how to be a lemming to the government yes um, yeah. but when it comes to actually making money being self-sufficient yeah um having common sense yes school is not the one and in fact people that I know that dropped out I'm not saying, oh, I'm not saying you, you kids need to do this because if you want to be a doctor and that's your passion of and course. Like that, then yeah by all means follow that way but I mean for me um people that I know that have dropped out of school and haven't gone full education are the ones that are multi-millionaires now that's so true I've known so many very successful people where education is not a massive part no. of their life no. And again, I'm not saying to drop out because there are certain things that I had to educate in a certain way to do what I'm doing, right? Yeah. But yeah, that's why, yeah. But 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 that's your passion. That's my passion, but it's not where I make my money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like that gave me a profession. Yeah. But off the back of that profession, the businesses that I'm involved with have got nothing to do with my education. Yeah. So I can see both sides of the coin. Yeah. No. You. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, if you did. If you want to be a doctor and things like that, then school's great. Yeah, of course it is. And, and you're more driven because yeah. it's set up for you. It's not set up for the kid that might be like, let's have a look at, well, Jim Carrey. Yeah. It's not set up for Jim Carrey. It was a teacher that saw Jim Carrey's potential that allowed Jim Carrey to follow that road as well as his own passion. But I can't remember who it is now, but there's a there's a really good uh, public speaker who was a teacher and an educator and he's called Sir Kenneth Robinson. Mm -hmm. And he did a TED Talk, actually. And that was the first time I came across him when I was researching TED Talks on how to be a good TED Talker to do my own. I was nowhere near as good as Kenneth Robinson. He's amazing. I was mediocre at best, but his was, his was brilliant. And he referenced in that TED Talk that I saw him do, um, the lady that choreographed Cats. Mm -hmm. And I believe she had a neurodiversity thing. I think it might have been ADHD. And she went and choreographed one of the most famous musicals, Broadway shows, and yeah. now worldwide of all time. Yeah. And that just goes to show that if you're neurodiverse, you're going to have a very skilled brain in I think other it's ways. Special. It is special. I think it is a special Superpower. thing to have. Yeah. Super, no, that's exactly what I think. Yeah. And, yeah. and as long as you are allowed to explore that, yeah. And and given the space to explore that. And that usually comes after the mainstream education. But this is the problem education. though. Schools don't let them explore that. No, they don't. They it's don't. like their way or the highway. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it's not, I mean, times have changed. Like they you have. said. It's evolved. Evolved, yeah. Yeah. And COVID and really, really has, I've noticed as well since COVID that my kids have seemed to have like quite bad mental issues yeah oh, so many kids do and it is because of covid yeah it because is they didn't have it before no and actually I, I was thinking about this the other they day they don't give kids credit for how much they went through with no COVID they don't because it is such a strange thing to be told by the government you've got to stay in your house yeah but You're whilst we're out. gonna have our parties by the way oh yeah don't forget that <laughs> um that must be so hard for kids to get their head round well it covid hit in my daughter's going up into gcse year now so it's a final year and hers hit during year seven and year eight so that first oh two years of secondary school where basically the education system was broken yeah. already and it's even more broken now screwed them all over mm. the mental health and the adhd and the autism and all of those things combined you know You've got a disaster yeah. there. Yeah. So I really feel for these young people, but I'm a massive supporter of young people as well because they've got so much 
they've got so much potential if we just if we just guide them if yeah. we just hear them if we just see them if we support them if we say do you know what you might not be good at maths but it don't matter you can come and work for me because you you're good at whatever it is you do you know so just can i just them. ask you something quickly of course you can. if you got to go into the houses of parliament and speak to i feel like i'm presenting you show now <laughs> go if for you it. got to go into the houses of parliament and ask the prime minister a question um like if you could have one thing changed in the education system what would you ask T- tell the prime minister oh that's a very good question i would ask why um so the, i would ask a question then i would give a, a, an answer uh, well i would answer his question but i would give some advice i would ask why the education system hasn't changed in 150 years okay so that would be the first thing what why because mm-hmm. i would yeah. really love to hear from the top people why we are still doing it the way we're doing mm-hmm. it and I would want the truth mm-hmm. and I wouldn't stop until I got the truth but other than that I would then advise but I think we kind of know why it's because they want us to be lemmings yes it is <laughs> and I would want to hear that and everyone's getting all out of control now yeah yeah no you're right <laughs> it is about control and it's about um positioning in my mind it's about positioning ourselves we're a tiny 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 little dot on the map right and it's all about trying to position ourselves yeah as something more it, it is gaslighting and manipulation and love bombing at its best the uk does that well um but then i would advise that we had a much more holistic view to education that we would need to do more outdoors education yeah that we would need to move I've started our bo- doing that a bit but, but that is if you're lucky yeah i, I mean i'm lucky because my daughter daughter gets to go to a thing called forest school forest school yeah yeah but it's not for long That's is because... it it's like one one we, my daughter did no, that it's, it's like an hour a week. an hour yeah yeah no, it's not. but but proper outdoor you know like yeah going back to basics letting people explore the arts more mm. you know letting people sing and dance and and paint and get messy and mm-hmm. not just in primary school because that's where that happens but in yeah. secondary school scrap gcses if 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 when I was at school and doing my GCSEs, I knew I wanted to work doing something like this. I used yeah. to think it was social work, but I, it wasn't. It was more like what I'm doing now. If someone had said to me, what do you want to do? And I and I gave, oh, I want to do something helping people. Mm-hmm. Right. These are the subjects you need to focus on then. You know, health and social care. You need to yeah. focus on um, something to do with like nurturing. Mm-hmm. You know, then they would have given me maybe four or five subjects in that area that I could super duper focus on they might have three teachers in that area that you do all your lessons in that area and if you change your mind fine come and talk to us we'll look at what we can incorporate in be more holistic Mm. be more flexible with education because Mm. you might have said you know I love cleaning and I like being glamorous and they go oh this might suit you then (laughs) you could do a little bit of this and a little bit of that (laughs) we'll teach you how to make your own cleaning products yeah then you go off and you go and have a business. Quick, you know you could have done that at sixteen. Yeah, there I are know. entrepreneurs out they there. They take you off on a, a bloody picnic. Yeah, have a, have a <laughs> bit of picnic and learn some maths. And it's some... like it's like a dog chasing a rabbit. Like if you've got two rabbits, the dog's chasing after. He's not going to yeah. catch him. Yeah, you're right. If you focus on one, one. rabbit, you're going to catch it. Yeah. So yeah. it's the same with... It's the same principle. Yeah. So that would be the question and that would be the advice. You know, like what? what's basically, what's the bloody point? Yeah. And here's a better solution. That's my son. Why do I have to go to that lesson? Because you do. Yeah. Because <laughs> you do. Not, I'm not me saying that, the teacher's saying, I don't want to be a scientist. Nobody's asking you to, but you've just got to go. I'm sorry. I know it. it's a waste of your time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a massive waste of yeah. your time and energy, but here we are anyway. Mm. <laughs> yeah. but at least we're you know i think our uh, uh, as as parents now mm. we understand that that system doesn't work whereas 40 years ago as i was at school you really were taught no this is the way it is whether you like it or yeah. not and your parents bought yeah. into that narrative as well do you not think though how much better behaved children were back then to yeah now? that there is that that is such a shame yeah the way i see people getting disrespected nowadays yeah it's awful on videos yeah. and i mean no i know everybody doesn't like the police force and things like that but you know there's just no respect there no anymore well, police uh, people forget this police enforce the law they don't make it yeah if you're a police officer your job is to enforce the law that exists you don't always agree with it if you're a police officer yeah you still have to enforce it because that's your job yeah you know and i think that's the difficulty with being a policeman you might have gone into it for all the right reasons and you might not agree with a lot of the law but you that's your job now and yeah we do need policing 
and we do need social structure and rules. I think the issue with discipline is a big one. We went from people getting whacked and caned at school, which isn't Mm -hmm. right, to to where we are now. But I think there's two reasons why it's gone the way it has. One is because it's it's not to do with the education system itself, Mm. but it's to do with the way that everything's become academies. Yeah. And each academy works slightly differently. It's quite confusing. And the the discipline that they're using is not a positive psychology discipline so it, they haven't found a good way to manage individuals mm. and and we have had and i believe um this is the impact of generational trauma we do see more adhd and behavioral issues and mental health issues now than ever before mm. and the onset of the internet david bowie spoke about uh, the way the world would go in 1997 in an interview and I cannot remember who he was being interviewed by but it was around night if you if you were to put into YouTube or Google David Bowie interview 1997 on the education mm. system he he spoke about what was happening to the world because of the internet so I wouldn't as much as I love the internet and see the benefit of it and social media can be a beautiful place if you use it correctly mm that has got a lot to do with the way that the behavior has changed as well. Yeah. Because everything that's negative will go viral. And, and, you know, you see someone shouting at an old lady and everyone's watching it and it becomes normal. Yeah. Oh no, it's just horrible. So there's a lot to be scared of. Yeah. And I think we have to navigate our way through this new world that we're in. And, and, uh, and again, which is why I really appreciate com- people coming on here and sharing stories because it does mm. start off conversations in people's homes or, yeah. you know, and it and allows us to go uh, be more, cu- just be more curious and more yeah. explorative and don't just take it. You know, if you're struggling with your kids in mainstream education, don't just take it. Find out what you can do to make a change. How can you get your children to have a more holistic, flexible education? What can we do to change that? These conversations, by the way, might turn into conversations where I go into the House of Commons or the House of Lords or wherever it is I'm supposed to go, the Parliament. I don't know. I'll knock on the door and see you'll let me in. <laughs> so- yeah, it's, it's, so, it's so, like, you can say, you can say and try so much, to, um, but I just feel like banging your head on the door. Uh, it only door, takes one voice. I know what you mean, but it only takes one voice to be heard in one place for it to have a knock-on effect. And that's why... It, although you might feel like that, us talking about it today mm. could have an impact somehow, some way. We can we can use great. snippets of it and send it to Rishi and say, "Oi, I know I'm not the only one though no, going through it. There's you're not. so many people, and um, like I said, even um, my son's key worker said there is a massive. I mean, there's a massive turnover in teachers. Yes. There's, oh, there um, is. Yeah. It, it's just not a nice place, I don't think, to be in the education system at the moment. I can't remember how many teachers are leaving my daughter's secondary school this year, but it's a shitload. Yeah. And uh, right. just talking about the NHS earlier as well, mm. the midwifery unit in Northampton, they lost, I think it was 43 members of staff in the in the last year because everyone's leaving nursing. It's the same with education. Why are they all leaving nursing? It's because the money's so bad. Money's so bad. Conditions are so bad. You know, again, they're not treated very well. It's awful. It's such a bad, such a bad situation. Mm. You're forced to get private health care. You're forced to look at private tuition for your kids. If you, but you have to be, this is the other thing I was saying about the business side of things. I'm a businesswoman, right? And I am someone that will work literally I'm not saying this is healthy, by the way, guys. Please don't follow my lead. But I will literally work every hour of the day. Yeah. Because I want to be able to provide my daughter with the best health care, the best education. By the way, I am not someone that says to her, you must get this, this and this. I say, I want you to be happy first. I want you to know you've done your best. That's all I ask for. Whatever mm. comes next. If you come out of school with no GS- GCSEs, but you're happy and you tried your yeah. best, that's all right with me, love. Yeah. That's all I care about. Just do you, be you. Mm. But I want her to feel that she did her best for herself, yeah. not for me. Because at the end of the day, she's her own person. I want her to know that she did the best for herself. But I will provide her with the tools for that. Yeah. That's all That's this is about. That's good. Like, I just feel like I would like my kids to come out of school with some sane mental health. Because I yes. just don't feel like 
the kids just since COVID, the mental health just gone absolutely down the pan. It's a real problem. And one of the things that I say to parents that are worried about their kids with mm. mental health problems is one, you're not alone. Like you've just said, yeah. you're not on your own. There's lots of people that are unfortunately in that boat, but there are some really basic bits and bobs you can do to help your kids with the mental yeah. health. And often it's not actually to do with the way they talk or think, because remember they're, prefrontal cortex i'll say this again that's analysis decision making logic creativity as well for those that don't know left side of the brain is logic right side is is um creativity emotion all those sorts of things actually i think creativity goes on in the middle but anyway yeah logic and emotion left side logic right side emotion then the prefrontal bit is emotional regulation decisions analysis so on so forth okay that's not fully developed until they're 21 yeah sometimes 25 yeah So within this period of time where they're being educated at school, they do struggle to emotionally regulate. They do struggle to make good analysis and good decisions. What we need to do as parents is instead of telling them what to do is ask them how they feel, Mm -hmm. give them the good somatic healing techniques like breathing techniques, grounding techniques, distraction techniques, hold space. And the most important thing you can do for your child is really, really listen. Okay. Don't dismiss them. Yeah. Really listen to what they're saying and then have that level of um, compassion to then want to explore that further. So, for example, now, if you if your kid's saying to you, look, I this is how I feel. I feel like I'm being excluded. It's causing mental health issues. You can go on to Google and you can go on to um, Google Scholar mm-hmm. and you can find this is just a really basic tip. You can find research papers on the subjects that you're interested in. Google Scholar. Google Scholar. Yeah. You can cite it, you can do a letter and you can cite the the evidence in that letter, put a link to that scholarly article and say to the school, and know your rights as well. This this is not an inclusive way of educating my child. Um, this is the damage of the you know excluding him every single day. And they have to work within the, the Equality Act, which is 2010. Or 2012. Mm-hmm. And if you were to cite the Equality Act, which includes businesses as well as education, know your stuff. Google scholarly. Scholarly. Or scholar. scholar. Google scholar. One of the two. Know your rights. And if you can put that into an email or into a letter, they have to action it. Mm. What a lot of these academies and schools are hoping for is that parents don't know the information. No, that's exactly it. Mm. Like that, I feel like they just want to like mug, mug you off. Yeah, mug well, you off. The thing is, autism is classed as a disability. I know. So <laughs> that's what I've been fighting for. Yeah, within the Equality Act, I think it's 2012. The Equality Act of 2012 tells you what they should be providing for your child as an inclusive space. Education is important, but so is well-being. Mm. So Google Scholar, find all you got to do is. Uh, I'm worried about my child's mental health. He's autistic. Scholarly articles on exclusion in schools. Okay. And you will find, this is for any parent that's going through the same thing, Mm. you will find research and evidence that you can attach to those letters and emails, but also quote the Equality Act because they have to function within the Equality Act. Yeah. I've done it myself and it works. they say they're meeting, you know, we're meeting all needs that we have to meet. Well, that's an opinion. Your opinion is different. Yeah. You're saying, actually, I don't feel like you are. We need to work together to make sure my son's education doesn't create further mental health issues. Because if it is, which I believe it is, you are failing him. Mm-hmm. And you have to really know that you are allowed, uh, all parents listening to this, you are allowed to do that for your children. Yeah. But often we're gaslit. And again, I don't want to blame all teachers because I think teachers on the whole are phenomenal human beings. But the academy, the business of schools shuts down the parents. That's that's correct. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, I've been treated the last. Well, it's been a year. I've been literally fighting for education for a year. That's hard. And I'm drained. Yeah, you will be. (laughs) And it will have an impact on your mental health. And they're like, well, we're just going to try different things in year eight. And I think, no, I've been going around in the same circle for a year. I'm sick of it. You'll find that most secondary schools put all of their effort into year 11 because that's GCSEs. That's where they want to get the results. The Mm. other year, then I found this through my experience and through talking to other parents, 
the first few years of secondary school, they're just, it's a holding space for kids. They really okay. only focus in year 11 because they want the results for the Ofsted reports. Oh yeah, it's all about the Ofsted reports. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. It's all government tables. And and that's where you've got to know your rights. You've got to understand that all the information is on that World Wide Web. It can be very, very destructive, but at times like this, it can be very, very helpful. Yeah. Remember, education is a business and, and we need to look at everything. This is why I say be a businesswoman. And it was what I was saying earlier. It's not just to monetize it. It's so that you can take that attitude into every area of your life. Once you understand business, you know, and, and how to talk the talk, mm-hmm. you won't go wrong. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited to learn more. Yeah, there's loads you'll learn from from we, just so the people know we're not we're not you know we, we when you of, say it like that education is a business yeah. then it's not it's not about the kids is it really no, it's not it's not so you've got to we've got to look beyond what we uh what we're led to believe mm-hmm. and and look over the wall and say ah there's all this other stuff going on mm-hmm. that we didn't know about and and actually the mental health side of things as you've referenced several times now if you're leaving education with really poor mental health, what does that mean for the rest of your life? Yeah, I know. It's, it's I know. really scary. That's what I'm worried about, though, with my kids. I just feel like they the school's just left them with bad mental health. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel. I mean, my daughter's school, um, junior school, I, they're really good. They are generally primary, they, yeah. Yeah, they are really, I can't fault them. But Jesus Christ, what a hit that was going... Uh, to secondary. The kids go, well, Rudy going into secondary school. I'm actually dreading it when my daughter has to go up. Yeah, at least you're dreading more prepared, it. though. Like, your brain will be expecting yeah, it. Yeah. I'm already on her EHCP plan, so I can get that done before yeah. she's there. But yeah. it's, um, yeah, I mean, as we said earlier, there are a lot of autistic ADHD kids coming out now. And I do think it's just where we're evolving. Yeah, we are. Yeah. The, the world is changing rapidly and that system is stuck in yeah. the mud. But when you came on here, did you know that you would be so passionate about this, talking about this? No, it's because I've been going through it a year. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it's on your mind. But this is why, like, when I told you, you know, like, I haven't really been posting a lot lately. And it's because I've been dealing with all this stress with yeah. my son's school. Yeah. It's taking up so much time because I'm having to learn all this education stuff that I don't really care about. Yeah. But obviously I do because my son's in it. So yeah. I have to. But... um. I never thought I would have these problems with my son. No. Um, I never thought I'd have this problem with schools. So I'm constantly in meetings. I'm constantly getting calls, um, constantly getting emails, detention this, detention that, detention this, detention that. Like, I'm not the kid at school here, but I feel like I'm having an education at the same time. Yes. On, and it's just like, I've got a job. Yeah. Like I said to the teacher, like, how would you feel if your kid's school kept calling? You can't come out of teaching and lessons. So it's what, why am I expected to keep leaving work? And then there's other situations where I've had my son actually. Um, the ring, we don't know where you, we can't locate your son on the premises. Don't know where he is. Okay, what? he's 11. He's autistic. I don't know where. <laughs> we're like, what sort of mood did he leave the school in? Well, I don't know. You're going to have to ring his mobile. We've got to go now because we need to go and teach other students. Okay, so there's me at work ringing round trying to find where my son's gone and they're just like that's your problem not ours well he's in your care though how's that not a safeguarding issue that's a huge safeguarding issue but no nobody pushes like obviously i i've made a big deal of this nobody high up sees that and does anything about it so it's just like what am i moaning for because you don't care well, what you could certainly do now is send a clip of this podcast to them and say, listen to this, guys. You know, I'm, I am out for you now. This is public. I know you haven't mentioned the school, but just no. so you know, this is about your school. You know, and I think oh, that's really I, important. I, I know it's not just about my No, it's, it's not. Because it's there are a schools. lot. Yeah. But it, it did, it did. It did bug me a bit because I was like, but and then I've gone to the key worker, they've escalated it, but yeah, it gets escalated, but then it just fizzles off into the cloud. So it's like, okay, so what if my son um has a meltdown, which this probably happens to other um a lot of other people's kids that have got autism, and he runs out and gets touch wood, it's not gonna happen, but gets hit by a car. What you yeah. gonna say that's not your responsibility? Of course it's their responsibility. <laughs> like you say, when they're at school, you you are that the child is in their but care. Like, well, but he's he's outside the gate, so it's not our responsibility now. 
Yeah, but how did he get outside the gates in the first place? Who wasn't watching him in order for that well, to happen? Well, teachers aren't allowed to touch the children, which no. I get. Yeah. I do understand that. So their point is, well, how are we supposed to stop your kid from having a meltdown? Because we're not allowed to touch him. But then you need to have the right staff in the schools that are able to help the child soothe soothe themselves and then mm. help to go through that process of bringing down that emotional dysregulation. Yeah. They need those people in the schools at all times. And obviously they're not going to say it, but obviously I can see that it's probably a lack of funding. Yeah, it will be, yeah. This goes back yeah. to the government. This is goes back to it being So systemic. it's like the teachers, they probably want to do their job, but they're caught in a bad situation because they don't have the funding there. And this is where we have to shout about the, the again, I asked you the question, did you think this is where it's going to go? But we have to shout about these things. Mm. We have to be voices that are heard in the sea of bullshit that the government put out there. We have to be those voices because Mm. if you're not saying your truth and you're not sharing that with other people, everyone's just being quiet about it. Mm. And it's time for, you know, you're, you're about to embark on a whole new business and career. And we spoke off camera actually about your, uh, you know, new cleaning products. Mm. And I said to you earlier, it'd be really cool to put things um, in there like sort of aromatherapy cells, your soothing smells for the mums that are stressed like you've been. Yeah. But then uh, I was just thinking, (laughs) you put them aromatherapy things in the cleaning products, you're not going to have the energy to finish cleaning. (laughs) Unless you get the energetic word. Sage flavour. Sage flavour. And you could have things. to do sage sprays. Yeah. For the house. Yeah. Oh, my God. Look, see, see, the business mind's ticking. Other than it's because, obviously, you have to get, like, your Reiki healers and that come around with their sage. But Little... You could actually just get a spray. Yeah, you can get, well, and oh, any uplifting aromatherapy, like your um, orange oils and your, yeah. you know, like, but natural aromatherapy yeah. smells and oils in your products. So whatever the person needs, say they've had a stressful conversation with the school, they want the lavender. Yeah. They'll use that. You know, they'll clean the windows and have a little snooze afterwards but if you want to feel zesty you'll have your orange oils yeah you know that's that's the we could go on for this but actually it really fits your experience match your cleaning which is therapeutic with the smells which can really help lift your mood or calm you down Mm. and you know have have the conversations in your communities with your other mothers and fathers that are going through similar issues Mm -hmm. so you know what a multifaceted and interesting life as well as stressful at times that you've led and continue to lead it's all just hugely interesting you know all these stories that I hear Mm. they really do just make me think wow we need to talk to each other more Mm. don't we yes we do we do need to talk to each other more because there's so much that we learn from each other and I'm really grateful that you came here I've learned a lot from you today Thank you. Like everything's a business. Everything's a business. <laughs> Even relationships. I this sounds really, really cold. But if you were to treat your relationship like a business and put the same amount of effort and strategy and structure mm-hmm. and routine and appreciation and time into your relationships the way we treat a business and 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 tried not to be overly emotional when we look at our relationship. Because when you look at a business, you look at a business like a strategy. When yeah. we look at a relationship, so many emotions can take over that we stop realizing that the same strategies that work in business work in relationships. And it's all about balance. It's about structure. It's about time. It's about energy. Can I just say, does business studies at school, does it teach you all this stuff about not, business? Not in the same. I mean, they'll touch on various different mm. um, psychologies around business, but it's not as in-depth as if you focus on a specific mm. strategy, a way of building your businesses it's it's not quite the same they they do the overall business studies rather than you know entrepreneurial marketing strategies Mm. so it's interesting and actually what's great about understanding those strategies is you can keep sharing them you you know yeah that's the great thing about it. Well, I definitely want to speak to you more about business. Yeah, we will definitely do that. Well we're gonna have some fun with it as well because I you know I want you to see I want you to see how easy it is. Yeah. It really is easy. It's time consuming sometimes, but it's easy. Yeah. And, you know, if you know what you're doing, um, just for people that aren't aware, we were talking about business coaching earlier, but we're going to do some stuff uh, with Danielle. But for the, when you know what you're doing, it's so simple. You can really, really make a lot of money. And 
as I said to you earlier, one of the things that excites me is watching people make money because it's life changing. If you're a yeah, single mum, that is life yeah. changing. And it it really helps. And the thing is, people will look at you and think, she doesn't need to earn more money because you look like you've got money. But actually, you know, you've got two kids, you're a single mum. You've, yes, you've had some success and you continue to do well with what you're doing now. But earning money isn't, it doesn't, just because someone looks like they're earning, I'm not saying you're not earning good money, but there Mm. were times when on your own as a single mum, you need more. Really struggled. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, obviously, being in this industry as well, like from month to month, you earn completely different. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I was just presenting for a company that's just gone bust. So it's just like you've gone from one extreme. Yeah. And now it's like, well, okay, what am I going to do now? Yeah. Where am I going to present now? Yes. Um. So, yeah, it's just you know and it's the same for actors and stuff yeah they'll be filming a film and then they'll be off work for ages yes yeah oh I work with actors and actresses and they do have really long periods out of work and it's scary yeah 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 Yeah. so you know having that business mindset and knowing how to cultivate money through the certain strategies that we'll we'll Mm. talk about um is a massive massive bonus yeah because then you won't I mean don't stop doing all your other things because that keeps your you know your profile up it also is something you enjoy yeah but having that toe in lots of different pools yeah does help yeah I need to yeah. I get so overwhelmed though but I'm, I want to try yeah that's what I was saying to you earlier and I think this is a good <laughs> tip for everyone whatever you're doing in your life mm. however big it may feel especially if you're excited about it keep it into bite-sized chunks whether that's mental yeah. health business family life don't try and do it all at once because you'll get burnt out okay and I feel like you've already got the the whole education system to that's deal burning with. me out that yeah. is burning me out and you don't need any more burnout so we just need to keep it simple yeah have have a timeline that you want to work towards this is again for everybody listening as well the timeline for something to work towards and then making sure that it's achievable chunks that you're using rather than going okay this is what I want and I want it now and then being disappointed when it doesn't happen tomorrow realistic timelines are really important but also believing in that version of yourself that's going to be there in six months to a year you know knowing she already exists she just has to have the map Okay. So that's the exciting thing is I'll show you all of that. Yeah. And then we can chart your progress with it all. Yeah. And those that are tuning in today, they can follow your progress, setting up your brands and strategizing and all of those things. And they can say, oh, God, yeah, they spoke about that. And look at it now. Yeah. And you can see it coming to fruition. Then you can go off and inspire loads of people and say, look, yes, I'm a cleaning influencer and a presenter, but this is what I'm doing. Yeah. Follow my journey because that will make you accountable, you see there's so many different ways that you can tap into this yes be part of be part of the gang if you're listening to this today and you've got an interest in cleaning you know whether it's you love to clean or you want to you want to be more like um daniella going to influencer follow her page what is your page on instagram so my my uh main page is at danielle mason uk and then i've got my cleaning one off the side which is at miss mason cleaning so follow M-M-C. those. MMC. MMC. She loves it. <laughs> now, what's that in Roman numerals? No, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure that's something quite profound, but perhaps you've got a really important name. You know, on the old BBC, mm-hmm. it used to say, or it might have even been ITV, there was Roman numerals at the bottom. And I'm sure it was MMC followed by a number or the other way around. Maybe. I'm going to Google that. Yeah. Um, because if it means something profound, then, you know, the universe um, aligns. Yes. <laughs> Yes. But honestly, follow those pages, guys, and, and watch the progress over the next year because we're really going to work on it, aren't we? Yeah, we are. And we're going to make we millionaires are. of us now. Yeah, please. We will. I really want a private jet. A private jet. <laughs> I've watched Cristiano, Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo all the time on Instagram, like looking at his yachts and stuff, thinking, oh my God. Is that, that's what you want. That's what you've got to aim for. Okay. And a better a better education system. We're going to turn yeah. around the government as yeah, well. Yeah, it, it needs turning around. Yeah. Richie Sunak. Have I pronounced him right? Richie Sunak. I think it's Rishi. 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 Listen to me, Rishi. <laughs> um, you need to put some more money in the education system. Yeah. 
<laughs> you do. And if you're not prepared to, then we're going to come knocking at your door. Mm. Two blondes on a mission. Yeah. <laughs> we'll change it. But thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me. It's been great. I've loved it. Good. I really appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you. I can't wait to uh, see what happens next as well because there's so much that's going to happen. I think you do yeah. need to chart your success, though. Share it with all your followers. Inspire them. Yeah. Oh, I found meeting you today very inspiring. I appreciate that because, yeah. like I said to you right at the beginning, you know, I, I looked at you 20 years ago and thought, I want to be like her. And now you're sitting opposite me telling me I'm inspiring you. It's like, how did that happen? I just, I, I just want to I wanna get the money in the bank. You're going to. I'm going to show you how. Yeah. It's going to happen. Oh. It, but you've got to remember, and I'm saying this to, to you know, to everybody that, that has got a plan or a dream or whatever, you've got to see the bigger picture and mm-hmm. you've got to do the incremental steps along the way. And if you feel that you're struggling, you've got to work with someone where you can turn to them. And that's where we'll, we'll do that together. We'll show, we'll show people how to do it as well. That would be amazing. Yeah. And, and it and it will work and I think it's just a case of having that long term strategy and being patient with yourself yeah because when when you've got a hundred different things going on in every single day it's hard to do that but watch this space everyone because yeah. this is going to be this is the accountability now we're going to share the journey on Danielle's page and maybe even on mine when we're doing bits and bobs together let's That'll share it yeah let's show people how they can do this yeah. too Okay. All right, my love. Thank you. Thank Thank you for having me. Thank you. You, little legend. Can we do some pictures? We can.